Let's pray before we look at the text, please. Heavenly Father, as we gather around your word now, we come before you humbly, longing to hear from you your revelation. And so we come before, before you open to your spirit working in us, convicting us of sin and drawing our praise and honor and glory to your name. Lord, we didn't come to hear the opinions of a man, but to, but to hear from your word. So I pray that we would elevate the scriptures, that I, in what I say, would elevate the scriptures, and that we would accept it as the word of God, which it is. Give us grace as we hear your word to be changed in the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we might be holy and blameless before you in love. We thank you that we have the opportunity to do that. Be glorified in this time together, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. On October 29th, 2012, New York City and the state of New Jersey were bracing for a direct hit from Superstorm Sandy. As the storm drew near, numerous tele national television outlets featured live reporters on the ground. And as one CNN reporter assigned to Atlantic City, New Jersey, reported on the de deteriorating conditions and the scrolling headlines below where he stood emphasized that hundreds were being evacuated from the city and that there was an impending curfew only or less than an hour away, three men without shirts danced into the live shot. After a few seconds of tomfoolery, CNN's producers cut away to another shot, but those men had accomplished their goal. They'd made it on national television. I think dancing behind the camera during a live report of a superstorm reveals a certain disconnect. Sandy took the lives of nearly 200 people in that area. The damages were estimated at $20 billion. But these men thought they should be the story. Their attempt at making a name for themselves was ill-timed and insensitive. But I see an analogy for us here. If we aren't careful, I think we can make our lives and even our salvation about us. There's a real danger for us to make life about us. And so we focus on ourselves. But I think Paul redirects our attention and our focus here in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Now this is a weedy passage. Maybe you've come today just like, well, let's see what Pastor Rory has to say about this. Election? Predestination? All of the weeds of Christianity. And that's a legitimate debate. It's something that we ought to talk about because the Word of God talks about it. But as we think about the difference between Calvinism and Arminianism, I don't think those titles are necessarily bad. They help define something for us. But I think we need to recognize that there's something significant about this debate that should humble us as we, as we engage in it. First, this is a difficult topic to understand. If it were easy, there wouldn't be a debate. Well, at least within evangelical Christianity, there's very little debate on the nature 
of justification, for example. I know that there is some, but, but not nearly to the level of Calvinism and Arminianism, predestination and election and human free will. The nature of the atonement seems relatively settled, at least in evangelicalism. But this issue is one that's more complicated. Good, biblical, godly Christians have disagreed with this almost as long as the church has existed. And the reason why is because if you read one passage, like maybe Ephesians 1, 3 through 6, you'd say, well, clearly God chooses. It really says nothing about us. Other, I mean, we're the object of everything, never the subject in this passage. It's always happening to us. It's not something we do, right? It's all God. But then you could just as easily turn to another passage, even later on in the book of Ephesians, that we're saved through faith. And now it seems like we're making a choice. And so all the way through the Bible, this happens as sort of back and forth. But the fact of the matter is that this issue, this debate, is not the focus of most of the scriptures. And I try, although I obviously have biases that speak into my reading of the text, I can't get away from them. I try to be aware of my biases. And I try to read the text as objectively as I can. I also recognize that this is not the focus of most of the scriptures. It's not the thing that we ought to major on. And it certainly should not be the thing that divides us. I am not afraid of claiming the term Calvinist, as I mentioned even when you were interviewing me to be your pastor. But I have many friends who would claim the name Arminian or reject the name Calvinist, one or the other, and I love them, and I consider them my brothers, and I enjoy fellowship with them. And so I think we all should be able to look beyond this issue and not make it a matter of division, even if it is fun to discuss at times. And I'm always up for a lively theological debate. But what, what I think we can end up doing, even in that debate, is making our salvation and our lives about us. And we have to be careful about this, because when we do this, there are certain dangers that play into it. When we make our salvation about us, we may look down on people who aren't Christians, for example. We may condemn them and say, Oh, you're worse than us because we're Christians and you're not. That isn't the way the Bible teaches us to look at those who have not yet believed the gospel. It's not the way God looks at them. He has mercy and compassion upon them. But I think we also have the risk of glorifying ourselves making it about what we've accomplished and how good we are to have believed instead of praising God whose grace earns our sal- or has merited our salvation. Paul redirects our attention to something or, or better, someone else in our salvation here in Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 3 through 6. This is actually in these verses he makes it really clear what his emphasis is by starting and ending with the same theme. Did you catch that as it was read? Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. So he focuses our attention on God right away, and he says, blessed be God. God should be praised. God deserves praise, is what he's saying. Praised be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. <clears throat> and our blessings come from, the bless- from him. He is the giver of the blessings. And Ephesians 1.6 then, notice how he ends this, to the praise of his 
glorious grace, or the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Again, he says, praise be to God, to the praise of his grace. The glory of his grace ought to stand out in all of this, not how good we are. And from that grace, he graces us, is what Paul says in verse 6. And so this book and draws our attention beyond ourselves, beyond our destination, and beyond our salvation in and of itself to the very God of our salvation. That is where our focus must go as we read Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. And if it doesn't matter whether you're Calvinist or Arminian. It doesn't matter if you want to emphasize election or free will. If you read Ephesians 1, 3 through 6, and you don't come away saying, glory to God, you've read it wrong. So Paul's point here is that God's plan to save sinners is glorious. And therefore... We should praise God for our salvation. I think this is the emphasis that he gets, that we get as we see the bookend of three and six emphasizing praise to God. This is our response. Praising God. I'm sorry if you were expecting more. I think he also tells us why we should praise God for our salvation. Four reasons. I just want to walk through these quickly. Four reasons to praise God for our salvation. The first is in verse three. It's our spiritual, it's it's the spiritual nature of our salvation. It's spiritual nature. You know, we're in the middle of a, a time in history when people are experiencing what they refer to as Zoom fatigue. Right? We're we are overwhelmed by virtual meetings and virtual everything, working at home, has people constantly in meetings, but not in person. And it hasn't taken long for our culture to recognize that although there are certain benefits to having the ability to have a Zoom meeting virtually, that we lose something. There's, a, there's something lost when we lose in-person meetings and replace it with Zoom meetings. You know, right now we are live streaming our service and there's something lost for those who are, who um, right now can't come for whatever reason. I mean, we're thankful that they are on the live stream. We've made it available to them because it is better than nothing, but, it, but there's something lost in not being in person. The nature of in-person meeting is it excels the nature of video conferencing. And I think we can all recognize that, even as we recognize the value of the technology. It's the nature of a thing that gives it its value. And what is the nature of God's plan of salvation? It's it's outlined for us in verse 3, again, where he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. This emphasis here is on the nature of our salvation being spiritual. This, This is a spiritual salvation that God is emphasizing here. And he does it in three ways. Each one of these phrases is parallel. They all start with the same Greek preposition. And so that emphasizes that they're all parallel and that they're reinforcing each other. With every spiritual blessing suggests that from him, from God, comes one continuous flow of blessing. And this is to be conceived Not chiefly in terms of the material gifts of which we think most readily, but in terms of the spiritual gifts that transcend but include the material. So he's not speaking of material things here. He's speaking of something spiritual in nature. And he reinforces that with the phrase, in the heavenly places. 
This is speaking of an invisible spiritual environment, one commentator says, as contrasted with the visible, tangible environment that we live in, or that we call earth. It is the realm of all the unseen forces, good and evil, which struggle to dominate the individual and corporate life of humanity. And so he's pointing to a realm outside of this earth, a spiritual realm in which the blessings that we've received are found. In other words, when you get saved, you don't get a new car. You don't get a new house. You don't get new clothes. You don't get more or less food. It's it's not about a physical blessing. Does God bless us with physical things? Absolutely. Absolutely. But that is not what Paul is talking about here. He's not saying, blessed be God for my house. He's saying, blessed be God for the spiritual blessings that he gives me. And that's reinforced yet again in the last phrase, in Christ. If in Christ, as we talked about last week, means that what is true of Christ is also true of us. We don't literally become Christ. Right? We don't turn into a different person. We are still ourselves, but it speaks of a spiritual reality of our position and relationship with God in which he changes us into the image of his son. That's the language that's used in scripture, that we are changed into the image of his son. It's a spiritual change. It changes our heart, our spirit. This is what the gospel Does And so the spiritual nature of the thing is what makes it valuable and praiseworthy. Romans 15, 27 reinforces the the spiritual nature of our salvation when he's speaking of the fact that the Gentiles have this responsibility to help the Jews in Jerusalem with their physical needs. And he says, For if Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things... They are indebted to minister to them also in material things. This is, this is what salvation is. It's a spiritual thing. But our problem is we tend to focus only on the physical, isn't it? Do you find yourself doing this? Overly focusing on the physical? And I think this is what drives, when I, when I look at myself, it drives my discontent. Like, why do I find myself complaining? I find myself complaining because because the circumstances I find myself in are not satisfactory to what I would like. And I expect God to make my life some sort of easy, endless vacation or something instead of recognizing that the gifts that he gives are primarily spiritual. There are physical blessings, I recognize, and we should be thankful for them. But but if I can focus my heart on the spiritual blessings that have been given to me in Christ, then I should be overwhelmed with praise to my God. So the first reason why we should praise God for his plan of salvation is because of its spiritual nature. The second reason we should praise God for his plan of salvation is its transcendent timing. It's transcendent timing. They say timing is everything. I I know that that's particularly talking about They use it particularly to talk about comedians, right? That a comedian's timing is everything. If you're going to be funny, you've got to say the punchline at the right time. There's a a knock-knock joke where you say, you know, knock-knock, who's there? Interrupting cow, interrupting cow who? And if your timing is off, the joke doesn't make any sense, right? You've got to interrupt them with moo when they say, interrupting cow who? You see, timing is important. It's kind of vital if you want somebody to laugh at your joke. You've got to have the timing right. The timing of God's plan is equally significant. In fact, it is so significant that it's actually outside of time. All right, so we're going to get into like 
mind-blowing territory here because it's outside of time and we don't understand that, but that's the reality of things. Ephesians 1.4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, I take that just as to mean since or because. So because he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that's why we're praising him and why these blessings are there. Because he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Time started at creation. Before that, there was no time, right? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then there was day one and day two. Those things didn't exist before that moment, before the beginning. Before the beginning, there was God and eternity and no time. So this is before before we're talking about here. It's a concept we can't even comprehend, but it is grounded in the fact of our eternal God. Now what does it mean that God is eternal? It means that he is outside of time. And ultimately it means that every moment in time, God is unaffected by. God is unaffected by time, right? So so yesterday was now to God, and now is now to God, and tomorrow will be now to God, and every moment, all of history, all of the so many thousands, if if you're young earth, or millions if you're old earth, you've got to realize that no matter how much time there has been on this planet, all of it is now to God. God is outside of that time. He is never constrained by time. And that's mind-boggling for us to try to picture and understand. But it's the reality of who our God is. And it is significant to us as we think about the plan of God. In 2 Peter 3 and verse 8, Peter writes, Don't let this one fact escape your notice. Beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years And a thousand years is like one day. Now, some people have tried to take that too literally and say, well, see, I mean, day one in creation was a thousand years. I think that's a horrible way to handle this text. I think what Paul or Peter is trying to say is that God isn't affected by time. It doesn't matter if it's been a thousand years or one day. God doesn't care. It's now for him. It's all now. And God planned, this is what it says here in this text, and I don't, I'm not really worried about the Calvinism, Arminianism aspects of this. No matter what you read this as, you have to recognize that God planned either individual salvation or all of salvation plan. I don't care which one you want to hold, but one of those two things you have to hold happened. God chose to do it before time began. And why is that significant? That means that God knew we were going to sin and he responded to it before we even had the opportunity to sin in the first place. So God, knowing that we were going to be awful, wicked people, rebellious against him, throwing our fists in his face, still determined to save sinners Before he created the world. And what does that mean? That means salvation starts with God. It has to start with God. He's the great initiator of salvation. Now again, there's all kinds of debate about what that means, that God is the initiator of salvation, and I'm not worried about that debate right now. I'm, I want to focus on the text, and I think Paul is emphasizing for us not the details of how God initiates salvation, but on the fact that God initiates salvation. If he planned it before the foundation of the world, then we cannot take credit for it. It never depends on us. He chose this plan. He laid this plan out before he ever made us. And it, real, and it helps us realize that God 
is all in on us. I mean, he is, he loves his creation. I have a friend who is a really strong Twins fan. And I listen to a podcast that he does, and they, all, they do these predictions periodically. And every time there's a prediction about baseball, he chooses the Twins, right? Who's going to win the World Series this year? The Twins. Who's going to win the World Series last year? The Twins. It's always the Twins. He's all in on the Twins. It doesn't matter wh- how bad it looks. In fact, I just listened to him trying to make a case for the fact that although the Twins have been tanking lately, that it's not over yet. You know, the, the Twins still have a chance, and, and they do, at least mathematically speaking. And, and yet, the fact is, is that this is the way God is in on us, right? I mean, even when we're messing it all up, God is still all in on us. He's still helping us. He's still optimistic about us, and he's still saving us. This is what God does. And he made this plan from before time. It has a transcendent timing. Number three, we've seen its um, its spiritual nature, its transcendent timing, and thirdly, let's see its transformative purpose. You ever try to figure out why some, somebody did something? This is a question that often gets asked in our home. Why did you do that? And it can get a little messy <laughs> as we're trying to get answers on some of those things. But we're constantly looking for the reason why someone did this. We, there, there was, I was just listening to the radio yesterday and they were talking about the fact that they were having a big memorial service in Indianapolis for a shooting that happened, I think it was two weeks ago. And they were saying that they still haven't talked about a motive or why the person did what he did and that, that people are demanding that they that in a full investigation find out why. Well, I don't know if there's going to be a why to that, but in this passage we are given a why. We're given a why God would plan cr- from before the beginning of time to have a plan of salvation. It's in verse 4. Since he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, so that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. So I think there's two aspects of this holiness and blamelessness before him. The first is a positional holiness and blamelessness that we have. It is through justification. God declares us righteous before God and he sees us as sinners Sinners who are saved by grace, covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. We don't cease to be sinners when, we, when we're saved, when we're justified. That just as if I'd never sin, it can be helpful, but we have to remember that it's not really just as if you'd never sin. It's actually God loving you and declaring you righteous in spite of your sin. And so justification is God's declaration of righteousness. And so technically, we all stand holy and blameless before him as soon as we believe the gospel. If you believe the gospel, this is the way that you stand before him. But he's also doing another, as- there's another aspect to that, and that is our transformation in which he is changing us into holiness and blamelessness before him in love. And so there's this constant change that he's working in us. Romans 8, 28 and 29 is another passage which has similar themes to this one. And what does it emphasize? That we would be conformed to the image of his son. This is why God works to save sinners, to conform us to the image of of his son. And this is connected in this passage to our love for each other. So that in love, you might think that's a little weird in your translation here in the NASB. There's a period, two words before the end of verse 4, and then in love. And there's debate about what in love is modifying. Is it modifying his choice? Is it modifying the holiness and blameless? Is it modifying his predestination in the next verse? And I I read a whole bunch of commentaries on it, and you could pretty much, you know, I'm like 75% on the fact that I think it's modifying holiness, holy and blameless before him. 
that here in this text, what he's trying to connect is the fact that if we love each other, this is a sign of the fact that he's working in us to make us holy and blameless before him. This co- coincides really well with passages like Philippians 1, 9 through 10, where Paul prays for the Philippians that your love may abound more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. And I think that's love for each other. So that, verse 10, you may approve things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. Now, there's, there's, it could be our love for God, that our love for God may abound more and more, and, and that, that's fine too, but I think it's probably just a general love. Love for God, love for man, love for your love should abound, and that makes you holy and blameless. This, this is in order for you to be holy and blameless. I think that's the idea that's being talked about here. That our holiness and blamelessness is connected to our love for each other. When we love each other in the church, I'm not just talking about nice feelings either here, right? This is like investing in each other, commitment to each other. When we have this in the church of Jesus Christ, what happens? That's evidence that God is working in us because it's not natural for me to love you. I don't like to love other people. I like to love myself. I like to take care of myself. This is how I naturally am. And so for God to be working in me, to make me holy and blameless, develops a love for you. And, this is, and both of these, both the producing of holiness and blamelessness in us and the love that he develops in us are in the power and purpose of God. There's a popular author named Rachel Hollis. She wrote a book, Girl, Wash Your Face. I don't recommend it. But you could read it if you wanted. But in her introduction, she says this, I want to shout out at the top of my lungs until you know this one great truth. You are in control of your own life. If you ever read that in a book, you should just put it down right then. Because that is wrong. You are not in control of your own life. God is sovereign. God is in control, and he is the one who will change you. You don't, like, conjure up change on your own. And that's what she's getting at in that book, is that you can become what you're supposed to be. It's pop psychology nonsense. You don't become what you're supposed to be. God makes you what you're supposed to be. It's it's his grace. And let me add to this too, that we often think we get saved so we can go to heaven. We have made heaven the end of our salvation. And while I'll admit, we get to go to heaven, and that is a good thing. I'm certainly not not looking forward to that. I want heaven. I want everlasting life. That's not why God saved me, though. He didn't save me so I could go to heaven. God saved me, according to Ephesians 1, 3, or 4, that I might be holy and blameless before him in love. This is the the transcendent purpose of God's salvation plan. Transcendent in that it's otherworldly. It moves beyond the, the sphere of this world. So we've seen the spiritual nature of our salvation. We've seen the, the transcendent timing. We've seen this purpose, transformative purpose. And finally, let's see its familial result. Familial result. Sorry, it's the best word I could come up with for this. It's familial result. Verse 5. He says, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the good intention of his will. Just over a year ago, our brothers and sisters in Spain, Seth Seth and Crystal Grotsky, adopted their three-year-old daughter, Mia. And what happened in that situation? Seth and Crystal went to China and they went to an orphanage and signed paperwork and they were given parental rights to Mia and Mia inherited automatically through that signature all of the rights of being a child of Seth and Crystal Grotsky. That means she can get into Spain on their visa. It means that they, she can she's a part of their family, that they're going to take care of her, that they're committed to that. This is what, adoption is such a beautiful picture of what God does in our relationship with him because he mentions that we have been adopted as well. And I think it's important for us to recognize that adoption isn't the choice of the one being adopted. Adoption is always the choice of the one adopting. And he is the one adopting us. 
And Paul, when Paul uses this language drawn from the home, he is emphasizing something significant about our relationship with God, the depth of the relationship we have and the ongoing commitment that God has to us, that he would call us his very sons. Uh, can you comprehend this? That you who rebelled against him, who sinned and went your own way, wanted nothing to do with him, that he would call you and call you his son? Or his daughter. This is amazing. It's miraculous and it illustrates God's loving kindness toward us. Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 3, 1 reiterates the same concept when he says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. And we are. This is amazing. I cannot comprehend the amazingness of adoption as a son of God into his family. It's pictured so beautifully at the communion table where we gathered this earlier this morning. When we gather at that table, God welcomes us through the blood of Jesus Christ to fellowship with him and not just fellowship with him, but eat with him. There's something equalizing about being at the table. I, I get that we're not technically equal with God, but he's, he's welcoming us. He's saying, you're my friend. Better yet, you're my son. This is a great familial result to God's amazing plan of salvation in our lives, and we must praise God for this glorious plan to save us. For a long time in my life, I thought my salvation was all up to me. I grew up in a Christian home, and I would pray and pray and pray for God to save me. I'd kneel beside my bed at night, and I mean literally kneel beside my bed at night, praying that if I wasn't a Christian, that I would be one then. If, I, if God hadn't saved me yet, he should save me now. And I was constantly bombarded by all of these fears that I hadn't prayed right or I, haven't, I hadn't believed enough or that I hadn't done enough in some way. It was a fearful existence because I depended on Rory and not on God. I was keenly aware of the horrible reality of my sin, but I was too enslaved to thinking that there was something I could do to save myself in my prayer or my belief or my life. And praise God, he eventually got it through my head, through all the scriptures that he'd been teaching me from the time that I was born, that believing wasn't about believing enough or about a prayer that I had prayed or saying the right words. It was about a complete dependence on God to keep his promises that he made toward me. But when I think back on what I was, a passage like this is even more glorious Think about this. Romans 9, 22 and 23 says, What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. God wants to show the riches of his mercy on us, on you, on me. And he planned a way to do that before the foundations of the world. And when we consider his purpose to make us holy and blameless before him in love, and the result that we become part of his family as adopted as his sons, how can we do anything but praise him and rejoice in his glorious grace? in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must praise God for these great spiritual blessings to this. We must join Paul 
in his songs of praise, particularly Romans 11, 30 through 36. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their, that is Jewish disobedience, so there also, so these also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. And then Paul says this, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. Or who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. And we echo the song of Moses, which is recorded in Revelation 15, which says, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? You alone are holy, for all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. This is what Paul wants us to think feel and say in response to the gospel because this is what God wants us to think, feel, and say in response to the gospel. We have a glorious God who executed a glorious salvation plan so that we sinners, we, might be holy and blameless before him in love, adopted as his sons. Sola Deo Gloria. Glory to God alone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you deserve all of the praise because this salvation is your plan and it's your grace. It is your love that accepts us and puts us with your children in the beloved. Glory be to your name, Lord God Almighty. From you, may praise be given to you from now and for all of eternity because you are worthy of it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.